All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Ryan Dacey. I'll be filling in for Chuck Sheehan, uh, who uh, is uh, unavoidably delayed for tonight. Uh, so I am calling the meeting uh, to order for the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, first item here, we will have uh, currently uh, seated will be myself, uh, also Lynn Conway and Gary Belke, and then uh, Ben Philbrick and Bennett Brissett will be seated for this evening. Uh, next item uh, on the agenda is minutes. Uh, we have minutes for meeting number 1757 from May 7th, 2024. Uh, do I hear a motion on the minutes? I vote to approve the minutes. Okay, I hear a motion to uh, approve the minutes as written and submitted. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the minutes? They're very thorough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, all those in favor of approving, of approving the minutes as written and submitted? Aye. Uh, all, uh, any uh, uh, against? Abstentions? Motion passes. Next item. I was uh, Ryan, I just want to, I was not here for the meeting. So oh, okay, so you're abstaining from that. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Okay, uh, next item is the public comment. This is an opportunity from anybody from the public to come up and comment uh, on any item, not on the agenda, but any other item that they wish to uh, be heard on. So if anyone has that desire, they are welcome to come up. Okay, uh, if none, then we will move on. Uh, next item, correspondence. Uh, Clifton, okay, no correspondence. All right, next item, uh, reports, staff, anything? Okay. Anything from the commission? Any reports, anything the commission wants to bring up? Okay, thank you. Next item, zoning enforcement and violations. Anything of note to call out, Clifton? Uh, none, just putting together the March and April ones because we had to cancel the March regular meeting, which was, mm -hmm. which would normally, uh, when we'd show this, so. Okay. That's why you have to. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next item, uh, administrative review, anything? All right, so we'll proceed then to uh, old business. Uh, next item is PZ2408 SPA 29 West Broad Street. Uh, this is a site plan application uh, to convert 1,200 square feet of existing commercial space into two 600 square foot apartments. Property is located at 29 West Broad Street, Pawkatuck, M slash B slash L 1-4-7. Property is located in the PV-5 zone. Uh, with that, uh, let the applicant, if you want to present. Thank you. Can you guys hear your friends? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. Can everybody? Okay. All right. So uh, this property uh, was purchased, we purchased it in 2016. I just identified it between uh, Bessie and Jones and Jones and Pocket Duck and Jones Creek Race along the Skinny Building and the Hurricane Girl on the side. Okay, now we're good. I was like, how, that's a lot better, okay. Um, to start again, we purchased the property in 2016. It's in between Mel's Creamery and Bess Eaton. It's a long, skinny building, uh, about 5,000 square feet. It has a hurricane mural on the left-hand side of the building, so just, to, just so you guys can put a, a picture to the, to the words. Um, in 2017, we renovated the commercial spaces uh, towards the front of the first floor of the building. We leased them to a hairstylist at an engineering firm. That happened in 2017. And during COVID, which took a long time, we renovated the second floor, which was vacant. I think it was formerly storage space, and before that it was uh, uh, the law offices of Mr. Crouch, uh, uh, who some of you may remember from town. And we renovated those to create two apartments uh, from that vacant space, and that was recently completed, and we received a CO on that uh, earlier this year. Um, in 2023, mid-2023, we had a commercial tenant in the rear of the building they left, they were a roofing company, kind of an industrial type, you know, they, had, they worked with sheet metal and stored roofing stuff and that kind of thing. And we had a difficult time renting the space after they left. And I think that's a reflection on how downtown Pawkatuck is, is changing, you know, away from the industrial heritage of the past and to, you know, a more thriving, you know, combination with downtown Westerly where people want to live within walking distance of lots of stuff. So due to that, um, we decided to ask you if we could put two small apartments there instead. And uh, the property is in the PV5 uh, zone. And in line with the guidelines of that zone, we have the following conditions. 
One, the first floor commercial unit faces the street, which is one of the criteria that is asked for in the PV5 zone. And that was existing, and we still have that. The unit in total will still have 45% commercial space, where uh, I think the minimum in the zone is 33%. Uh, and this is to ask for one unit per thousand square feet of lot area. The lot area of the, uh, the lot area is slightly under 5,000 square feet, so we would have maximum four units at, at this juncture. We already have two upstairs, we're asking for two more in the back, and that would max us out. To support that, we need, five, we need four off-street parking spaces, one per residential unit, and we have five. And that's uh, pretty much the long and short of it. I would, I would open it up to any questions the board might have. So I ju just to clarify, you would have five for the four residential units, and what do you have for the commercial unit or the commercial property? This building is in the downtown, uh, downtown Pocketuck parking overlay district. Uh -huh. Therefore, we do not have to count, because of the availability of on-street parking, we do not have to count for our commercial uses. Okay. Um, currently, who uses those parking spaces? Uh, in, in the back of the building or on mm -hmm. the street? In the back of the building, uh, two tenants that are just in the uh, process of moving in, a couple of my construction guys. Okay. Right Thank now. you. Any other questions from the commission? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> The Water Pollution Control Authority, you'll have to meet some specifications for them. Uh, I've, not been I've not been advised that, uh, Clifton, perhaps some guidance on that. Yeah, there's a comment. In our staff report, it mentions them needing detailed information. Um, it, it, it specifically asks, if I may, that it, uh, the, how the connections to the sanitary system would be, will be made. Okay, there's an existing lat. Okay, thank you. Sure. There's an existing lateral. I believe it's a four-inch lateral in that rear area, and the connection would be made through that. No additional laterals need to be. We may have to modify it inside the building to kind of connect the dots to where the the uh, the toilets and sinks will go, and so on and so forth. But there's already existing lateral in the rear of the building that serves. Okay. The, the existing, there's an existing vacant commercial unit in between the front and the back, that, which is vacant. It was Irish Rose Tattoo, and then it was a bridal shop. Um, that shares a lateral towards, the rear, towards the, the rear of this unit, to the rear of that unit in the front of the units we're asking to change to apartments. And that go, it's, it's on the map, and it goes out to the lateral, which runs down the alleyway there. So no additional work should be done there. Okay. But you would be comfortable submitting the, the more detailed plans that the WPCA is, is requesting? Yes, to, to document that connection. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? No. Staff, Clifton. The only thing that I captured was um, the need for the gross floor area calculation to support the forty-five percent that's mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, and I asked the applicant to provide that. I think he has provided yeah. that. Okay. So that, that addresses the first recommended stipulation that I had. Okay. Um, the other two are just standard. And then if you wanted to add the one. Yeah, I'd add the one. Okay. All right. Uh, with that then, do I hear a motion from the commission on this application? I motion to approve. Okay. And is that motion to approve with the uh, stipulations, the three stipulations, the first one would be final plan shall be reviewed to the satisfaction of the town engineer. Uh, the second would be prior to the issuance of a zoning permit. The final plan shall be signed by the commission recording the town's land evidence records. And then the third would be for the applicant to provide uh, the additional plans uh, to document uh, how the, uh, the sanitary system connection would be made. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Those three stipulations. Ben, do you have a because he already said he just got the first okay. one, the GFA calculation, so I took that out. Okay. All right. Uh, motion has been made. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Anyone? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Ryan, before we yes. get, um, <clears throat> Mary Ellen, have you been seated as an alternate recently? Okay. So I was thinking, I don't think it's, I'll sit in for the St. Edmunds because okay. I was here for that. All right. And Vin was here, Bennett was here. Yeah, I could be there for that, but I shouldn't be, I think it's Mary Ellen's turn to be the alternate, if need be. Oh, but you have a quorum with the four you have. Okay. Right. Right, yeah, so we can just proceed with the, with the quorum that we have of the regular members. I think I'm trying to, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to Clifton for regular members? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry Thank you. That. No worries. Okay. All right, uh, next item is the public hearing for PZ2402 SPA and CAM for St. Edmunds of Connecticut. Uh, do I hear a motion from the commission on to reopen the public hearing? Yes, I make a motion to open the uh, reopen the public hearing. Okay, thank you. So that's, uh, do I hear a second on the motion? I second the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. The uh, public hearing for the uh, St. Edmunds uh, retreat application is reopened. Uh, we will follow the same. Uh, same agenda uh, and format as we have with the previous hearings. The applicant will present. The uh, commission will ask questions of the applicant. Uh, the staff will give input. Then there will be an opening for public comment, uh, either in favor or against. Uh, and then the applicant will have an opportunity to rebut. And then the uh, commission will then proceed with how we choose to direct, whether to vote on it or, or how we proceed. Any questions on the format? And just as a reminder, if you could please, if you want to speak either in for or against, please sign up on the sign-up sheet. Uh, with that, the applicant, you are, you are up. Uh, good evening, Attorney Rob uh, for the applicant. Uh, I just have some exhibits to give to Clifton for distribution. Thanks everybody uh, for coming back and uh, hearing from us tonight. Uh, as you recall, we were uh, here in March uh, and we are now back tonight to complete some of the issues that were uh, brought up last meeting uh, and we will proceed uh, to explain uh, and go through some of the resubmissions that we made to you. Uh, there was a filing last Wednesday uh, which hopefully uh, has been distributed to you, uh, but we'll be going through that tonight uh, just to make sure that you understand some of the work that we've done uh, in between the two hearings uh, and to help you to walk through uh, the particular application. Again, um, this is an important uh, project uh, for uh, our, my client, St. Edmunds. There's really two parts, which we will carefully again go through with you is that there is demolition that's going to occur on the island that is to reduce uh, the amount of buildings that presently exist. And then uh, with that additional uh, ability, we're going to be constructing uh, the new structure, which we, you, you will be shown, uh, which is much more conforming in many respects uh, to your regulations. Um, so we are basically looking to reduce uh, the nonconformities that presently exist with some of these buildings. Um, I'm going to introduce now uh, the staff that will, my engineering and architectural staff that will lead you through some of the changes and then I'll come back um, and we'll also have uh, two more speakers uh, uh, with us tonight. Um, so first to go through uh, some of the engineering changes uh, and responses to the town engineer. Uh, Matt Steffen is here from the BSA, uh, BSC group um, to walk you through that.
Good evening. Good evening. Um, would I be able to get my uh, slides? Yeah, thank you. For the record, Matt Steffen, uh, civil engineer with BSC Group. Uh, so thanks for joining us tonight. Um, just as a reminder, you know, we're here tonight to respectfully request the site plan approval. And some of the design objectives for the project, as I mentioned at the previous hearing, are to enhance the campus experience, improve site accessibility, and really minimize impacts by disturbance, uh, being sensitive to the, the island and the, the coastal environment. Uh, so I'm going to keep it uh, fairly brief tonight for the civil engineering portion. Um, so what I'm going to basically review is kind of go over the major items uh, for the site portion that we had discussed at the last meeting and kind of walk you through how the plans changed, what we did to address them. And then um, I'll also focus on some of the site lighting and go into a little more detail about what we're proposing to do. So looking at the site plan here, um, really to summarize the changes, um, effectively what we've done is we've reduced the square footage of the building from 6,600 square feet down to 5,600 square feet. And that comes as a reduction of two bedrooms, so from 15 to 13. So you can see on the screen there in green, uh, that's the new building outline. The position didn't really change. Effectively, the north wall basically just moved south. And so you can see what we've done is we've adjusted the associated uh, parking area uh, sidewalk, landscaping, and everything, just to tighten that in. Uh, apart from that, it's effectively the same plan that you uh, saw previously, all the same design intent and uh, the way that everything functions. Looking at the north portion of the site, uh, where we're going to be demolishing the Angel Hall building, as you can see in red on the screen, uh, we had discussed uh, previously at the last meeting that during the architectural review meeting, uh, it was suggested to provide an accessible route from the gravel parking lot to the chapel. So at the time, we hadn't had a chance to incorporate that into the plan. So I just wanted to show that uh, in this plan set tonight that we have incorporated a permeable paver sidewalk to provide an accessible route uh, from the two handicapped spaces as well as the rest of the parking in the gravel lot. And then we have a little bit of uh, landscaping as well just to break up a, some solid lawn. <clears throat> so. This is a shot of our lighting plan, and uh, what I want to talk through is what exactly we're proposing and what will be removed even as well. So our lighting is full cutoff, uh, dark sky compliant fixtures. Uh, the color temperature is 2700K, and that's, that's kind of that softer yellow type of look, much less, uh, much less intense than the, the very bright whites and things like that. So we've really tried to go for a very low color temperature. Uh, the light spillage is very low, and then we have uh, some additional like bother lighting around the, uh, the parking areas and the walkway, and that's really for safety, to illuminate walkways in the winter when it gets dark out early, that type of thing. So what I, I want to draw your attention to is the graphic on the bottom uh, right there. So that really demonstrates what it means to be dark sky compliant and how the fixtures are actually structured. So you can see it's really all about focusing the light downward and providing no lateral or vertical, you know, upwards uh, illumination. And so that's why when you see on the plan here with the, the dark blue line, that's the perimeter where the photometrics go to zero foot candles on the ground. So uh, as you can see on the plan, the, the maximum distance from that is only 30 feet from the building. The illumination at the ground level is now down to zero. So it's, it's very low impact lighting that we're proposing. So right here is an example of not dark sky compliant lighting. This is on the Angel Hall building. So this is a good photo of how the light source itself is actually visible. It's very bright. You can see it from quite far away. So this building is going to, of course, be removed. And so that's part of how we're hoping to improve the overall lighting and visuals of the island. Uh, similar lighting on the maintenance building here. This is the other building that we're proposing to demolish. So you can see some more very bright lights, exposed uh, sources. You know, it's not focusing the light down at all. And then now this is the Ender's house. This building is going to remain, but what we wanted to, to uh, offer is that with the proposed Kenyan Cottage building, it's, the finished floor is not only much higher than the maintenance building, but it's also going to be two stories. So we're anticipating a significant reduction in visibility of these lights just by means of construction of the building. So I think the view from the west is going to see much less of that. And then just to review, uh, these are the different fixtures that we're proposing. So uh, similar to what we were saying in that graphic I just showed uh, previously for the dark sky compliant, you can see that 
all the external fixtures on the outside of the building are effectively shielded. So no visible light sources, uh, no light going up or out. So it's all concentrated totally down onto the ground. And it's, again, it's really just for, um, for safety, for illumination of walkways uh, during the, the summer month, the winter months, and uh, just to make sure folks don't trip or anything like that. So that, uh, that concludes the, the civil portion. Those are the major changes that we've uh, revised on the plans. Uh, we have addressed the town engineer's comments. Um, if there's any, any questions on those, I'm happy to go into some more detail, but this was the big picture. Okay, thank you. Lynn? Hi, thanks for that. So uh, the lighting, would there be hours that you would have the lights on, the external lighting? Um, they could certainly be set to, you know, there could be some kind of curfew. That'd be really a decision for the owner. I don't want to speak to their lighting schedule, but mm -hmm. for safety, yeah. All the lights would be on all night long for safety reasons. Is that what I just heard? I'm sure. Yeah, come up to the podium, please. Good evening. Oh, and could you, just for the record, can you yep. state? Oh, okay. Julie Thank Bartlett, architect uh, with ZDS. Thank you. Um, and yes, the intent would be that all light fixtures, the few wall sconces and the bollards would be illuminated throughout the course of the evening for, uh, for safety as people would be walking around the island, similar to the other lights that are uh, there currently. Um, we're just trying to improve the amount of lighting that is on. Um, the, with dark sky compliant and um, bollards instead of taller fixtures. Mm -hmm. But in the parking lot currently, is there lighting? This is not, we're not talking about lighting in the parking lot. We're just talking about lighting on the proposed building. And the pathways. And the path. And so are, is there lighting on the pathways currently? There's lighting in the main drive. Uh-huh. And there's lighting on the buildings that illuminate the other pathways. Okay but There's not on the pathways themselves. The bollards are addition. I just want, I'm just trying to understand. Admittedly, I, I believe there are bollards and other site lighting fixtures on the island. This is, my focus has been this particular building. Mm -hmm. I can't guarantee that there is one or another to answer that. Okay. If Can you, if you can, thank you. Hi, uh, Father Tom Horn. The, uh, right now, the, uh, the paths are lit by spots from the buildings, uh -huh. but we're, we'll be changing them to the low-level ballards along the pathways. Okay, I see, so you're exchange, exchanging, okay. And then um, my other question is, you, you had a picture, and I really appreciate the pictures, mm -hmm. they're really effective. Um, of the building that you're keeping, and you said that because the new structure, proposed structure is two stories, you won't be able to see that lighting. Well, is there a reason you couldn't just change that lighting to match, and so it's all nightward facing, and then you're all, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the light on the right-hand side is my room, and it lights the stairs going down, the outside stairs yeah. where I come and go. And the one on the left is Father Dick's uh, room, and it lights the stairs um, by which he comes in and out of his room. So we could change those to motion centers, centers sensors, but they're really basically to, uh, for us to come and go without tripping and falling. That seems reasonable, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from anyone on the commission? Any, any thought about noise changing from the island with buildings coming down or, I know, because with water, everything travels so much. Any do, you, uh, do you mean during construction or post-construction? Not, post -construction? not during construction, but just post -construction. Yeah, no, post no change in operation, so it, I assume it'll be the same levels as currently. Okay. Thank you. Other? Most likely it will be quieter because We'll be moving farther into the island, out to the um, ocean part, away from uh, Mason's Island. So it will be, they go to bed early. No, <laughs> but it will be less, less noise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for this gentleman from the commission? No? Okay, your seat. All right, thank you very much.
Good evening. Give me one second as I get this arranged here, please. Um, uh, Julie Bartlett with oh, the, the architect you. with ZDS uh, here again. Thank you again for having us here to present. Um, as Attorney Vina mentioned, we're here to try to address the questions that were raised uh, last time. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, the FAR on the island. And because I know square footage and lot coverage was a topic of conversation. So the ex we wanted to bring it back to what was the FAR prior to the chapel being constructed back in 2002. So here's a quick site plan with the chapel removed from the island prior to the chapel being constructed. And we performed a structure analysis of the existing structures on the island. This was um, based on some of the information provided in the 2018 uh, Stonington Record Report from Jason Vincent. Um, that's what sort of gave us some of this information in addition to um, our clarification of the uses. We tried to clarify where the number of beds were in each, in each um, building the types of functions within each building. I know those were topics of concern previously. Um, a clarification on, and then we also had a scan, a laser scan data, um, laser scan done from a third party who specializes in existing conditions verification. So that scan data verified the square footage of all buildings currently on the island. And with the zoning Code with, based on the Stonington zoning requirements of the fact that stairwells and spaces under six foot six, and there's a variety of exceptions within the zoning code that are non-contributing square footage relative to FAR. And so based on the data from the third party consultant, we then took that information, we verified it, found a couple of nuances. So the data is in the column that says square feet data, the blue text, and then we recognized there was a some square footage they didn't calculate, some other roofed over space and porches. So we added that square footage back in. And then we found spaces that they were that we were able to eliminate, some areas that were under six foot six, some basement areas that were not occupied for livable space, which totaled our contributing square feet, which is the pink column at the right hand side. We organized this based on when we believe these buildings were built in chronological order, starting from the original Ender's house um, and ending at the maintenance building prior to the chapel being constructed. So based on the total contributing square feet here of 35,273 square feet, um, which was slightly less than what Jason Vincent's report back in 2018 was, but very similar, um, we I apologize, but the um, FAR was cut from this. So if you did the math, uh, I did add this to the following slide. The FAR of the existing square footage prior to the chapel construction was 0.081. In 2001, there was a variance requested to build the chapel for a variance to increase the FAR to 0.083. We believe that there was an error at that time. So the and I'll uh, show this to you next. So when the chapel was constructed, here's a site plan with the chapel constructed, the existing conditions on the island as is today, and we revised our structure analysis based on adding in the chapel. And so take the prior table that I just shared with you, you add in a chapel of 4,400 square feet approximately, that totals 39,685 square feet with an FAR of 0 0.091. That FAR, is higher than what was granted in 2001 with that variance. We believe there may have been an error. This is prior to all of our involvement on the project, but there was, um, there was never an analysis done of the existing square footage after the chapel was constructed until the Jason Vincent's analysis in 2018. So the existing island is, as our understanding, is, in, is a nonconformity. It is existing as it lives. It does not comply with the variance that was granted back in 20, 2001 or two. Um, so as we were proceeding with trying to propose a new structure here, we did not want to increase the, in, the nonconformity in any capacity. So our proposed structure was, which is one of the reasons why we intended to do some demolition of existing structures. So as a reminder, we're planning on demolishing the existing maintenance building on um, the west side of the island. 
Angel Hall next to the parking and a couple of ancillary sheds on the island in order to construct this, the new Kenyon cottage. This last table explains again these, uh, the existing buildings with a clarification as to what structures are scheduled to be demolished if this plan goes according to plan. And what our total, um, and then a proposed structure of Kenyon Cottage at 5,629 square feet. One of the other things that we did from last time we were here till today was we modified and reduced the proposed building uh, by almost 800 square, by approximately 800 square feet. We refactored how many beds needed to be moved around on, on the island. Um, so there's now only, as, uh, as Matt mentioned, there's only 13 beds in, the built, in this proposed building. So we are reducing our proposed design is to construct less than what we are demolishing to decrease the nonconformity of our FAR on the island. To recognize that there is a nonconformity we're trying to pro provide a building that will improve life safety, improve accessibility for the existing uses on the island, but we're trying to reduce the, the, the nonconformity here. So my next slides are to talk about the modifications to the building, but if we do want to talk anything more about this, these tables, the FAR, um, if I may, year, I can answer Yeah, this is uh, Ryan. I, I'm curious, you mentioned that you believe there was an error previously made. Could you elaborate on that? I'm trying to understand when the what chapel you mean. was prior to the chapel being built, mm -hmm. the FAR on the island was 0.081. Okay. The variance request was to 0.083, mm -hmm. with a an assumption that the existing island's FAR was 0 0.043. That's what it indicates in the variance request in 2001. So we believe that there was at some point a misunderstanding or miscommunication as to what the existing FAR actually was on the island at that time. Because per our calculations, as it currently exists, and without us any modifications, it was 0 .081, not 0 .043. Hmm. Okay. I can't, I can't say that it was actually an error, but we don't understand how there was that big of a difference in square footage calculation. Hmm. Okay. I'm kind of, Clifton, I'm kind of curious, is this something that we've had an, even an opportunity to look into? I mean, it... uh, not yet and not officially, no. Okay. Um, it's going to take myself and staff time to kind of okay. go through this analysis. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Just so I have this, you thought it was point zero. Oh, you, you thought it, not you personally. The application, when it went for the variance, said that what they had on the island already built was 0 .04, and in reality, it was 0 .08, whatever. Correct. One. So the, okay, and, and the structure the chapel structure size did the proposed chapel structure structure size at that time was four thousand mm -hmm. whatever so that did not change correct. so it was just an ingoing incorrect number mm -hmm. correct but double yes yeah <laughs> fairly significant and there's no one on staff from two thousand and one that can say anything about this. On the island? I'm not sure. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Attorney Rob Avina, um, I, I, I'm not sure if Candace was here or not. I guess we'd have to check. Uh, that's all I can think of. Joe Larkin was handling the application. Uh, I worked on, Attorney Rob Avina, I worked on the chapel. But at the time, we were focused more on the height, if I recall. We also got a variance for the steeple of the tower of the chapel. Uh, Cherenzia uh, was working on the application. The best we can tell, and it's again working with an old record, is that the number 0 .083 was pretty much where the island was. Yeah. That, that was 
the existing gross square footage, which was on the island, of course, going way back before the residential zone was changed and the RC120 was put in and it reduced down to 0.04, but the existing nonconforming bulk was already existing. So the best way we can explain it is to say, well, the variance was requested because we could not put a new structure on the island because the FAR was already over the new reg. Um, but we got the variance and it was recorded. So in fact, the chapel was built in conformity with relief requested for bulk plus the height. Uh, what um, the opponent's attorney has said, and I agree, is what is interesting is we can't find what would be called an as-built, where once you build the chapel according to your permission and there was a site plan approval and there was a variance granted, that that site plan as-built would have said, okay, th this is now the FAR of the island, right? Because going forward, nothing else has been built. We can't find that. The next clue we found, and we did some digging, obviously, and reviewing, was the exhaustive report filed by Jason Vinson in 2018. So he actually engaged and went out to the island, of course, uh, with permission, was reviewing the buildings, reviewing the uses, wrote the report that's in, that's in this record of this application, and he basically said in 2018, yeah, plus or minus, I find the FAR right now to be about 0.094, which is probably pretty close to right, given at that time the chapel was there. Um, and so that report became, you know, what we were using when we were here last time. We were using that report to say, okay, if we have to be under 0.094 by adding our new building but eliminating other buildings, then that's what we will shoot for. Because we don't feel, and, we, and of course we can't, come in and say we're going to build any more bulk on the island uh, than is existing, non-conforming bulk, unless we go get a variance. So we weren't intending that. So down come the buildings, the maintenance building and Angel Hall and you know as much as we could spare in order to use that square footage that FAR for the new structure. That was the intent. Um, when, when questioned uh, by, by consul, we went back, looked at our laser study of, of the existing buildings, which, uh, you know, Julie's firm did a terrific job with, looked at all these old plans. That's when we came to the conclusion, wait a minute, the, we, we can't be at like 0.083. That, that we have to claim by law was probably what the island was before the new chapel and was obviously higher than what the regs call for. The, the island has always had gross floor space greater than 0.04. And so when we recalculated it back, yeah, that makes sense. It was around 0.083 that, that they were at. Then we added the chapel and if it had been a uh, uh, as built, probably would have come out in the 0.09s or so. So using that, we've done our very best, which is the, the replay you're seeing right now, is to keep going as low as we can possibly go to actually eliminate some of the non-conforming size of, of the FAR on the island. So uh, in, in accordance with that and with accordance with Clifton and Candace's reports about how the maintenance building was too close to the shore uh, it was non-conforming in many respects. We are cleaning that up and we're putting a building on that's compliant, more compliant, and as a matter of fact, the building is compliant with your zoning. So the whole effort of this application in total is to lessen the non-conformities on the island and still be able to replace a building because we're not exceeding the existing conditions, which we can't do. We, we have to go get relief to do that. So that's the theory. Thank you. That was, that was a great explanation. So just to summarize, with the current plan, your new proposed plan, what will the FAR be? 0 0.089. 0 0.089. But your variance is only for 0 0.083. We understand that. 
So you would have to go and get a variance if you went. So yeah. what I presented in my brief and what I'm claiming is, is that over the period we're now looking at, which is over 20 years, and the report of the zoning officer in 2018, the nonconformity of the island has been existing and no one has made any claims regarding it. And it's at the point 094 or so. That's what we know for sure, is that the existing buildings with the chapel are roughly 0.094 and 0.093, somewhere in that area. So our goal is to be less than what the existing conditions are. Because we're claiming over all this time that whether or not a mistake was made back then is almost not relevant now. We have those structures, we've been using those structures, and we intend to keep those structures, but rather than keep the aging some of them non-conforming structures, we would like to reduce that as much as we can and put a new structure on that's, that's less non-conforming than what, what was there. So it's the approach that we have to take because we can't really go back in time to a time when even the chapel didn't exist. Um, it's been there, it's, 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 it's now part of, of what the gross, gross floor area is. Any other questions for currently on that particular? Okay, you may proceed. So as I mentioned, uh, we are reducing, and as, as we've all mentioned, we're redu we've reduced the previous design that we pre presented to you folks um, a couple of months ago. We m only are ha uh, showing 13 bedrooms in this building, so it'll be one studio, one apartment, one ADA unit, one RA unit, and then 10 standard bedrooms. Uh, we modified uh, the floor plan, so the same concept. The right side of the plan uh, from an exterior didn't really change. We are keeping a, a throughway, a uh, visible throughway with a, sort of a lobby accessing a shared program space, and then to the, uh, to the left is the residence lobby, study space, fitness, and bedrooms and bathroom. Second floor is exclusively bedrooms and a small reading nook. Uh, no change to the basement. And the modification to the facade when we made these ch program changes is essentially that we've removed the, um, the, the bay windows from, the, from this portion of the building, um, and, but the other architectural elements really didn't, didn't change. We still are carrying a lot of uh, field stone at the base, a stucco, red trim, red windows, and uh, the rear of the building, again, we did preserve the bay windows. We wanted to increase, keep the windows facing the water uh, in as much capacity as possible. Um, we did modify this view also to show you the, the, the basement, the, the, the garage is accessed on the lower portion from the basement um, and for, the, for storage uh, space. And again, a reminder of what the existing uh, Ender's maintenance building is versus what our building will be, uh, the view from our building, again, in a sketch format. And we did provide uh, elevate, flattened elevations for your use as well for reference. Um, of all four sides of the building as well. But no changes to uh, other architectural elements um, that we previously proposed, just a reduction in scale and space and bedrooms. Okay. Happy to answer any other questions. Any other questions from the commission? Anyone? I, you know you said this, but what, <clears throat> what's the, the total square footage of the buildings right now? Of the, all of the buildings currently? All of the buildings currently. 39,685 square feet. And then after your, and that fact is until the 0.089 That is 0.091. Okay. And, and then, then following. And what's gonna be the projected square footage after? Total after? 38,808 for 0.089. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for this? Okay, thank you. Kevin, or Kevin next? Or oh, yes. I'll just get this up. Uh, last time there was some uh, questions regarding the existing activities on the island, uh, which 
Julie has listed uh, on the new box for you and, and located where they are, uh, where those uses were, and where they'll be uh, at the end of this um, uh, uh, construction of, of the new facility. Um, we'd also um, uh, like to present Kevin Miller. Uh, he's our uh, uh, head of contracting uh, for Enders, uh, and he's just going to go through a couple more questions you had last time uh, regarding um, the existing conditions. Um, traffic, as you know, is not part of a site plan application, but there were questions from the commission. Um, so Kevin uh, was going to give you a couple of uh, comments regarding that. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Kevin Miller, and uh, I work with Father Tom there, and we're uh, basically, I help him out with all his construction projects. Uh, when I first started uh, with Ender's Island, there was, uh, I, I ended up going in when we were doing some fire escape and, and um, fire escape situations there, and I ended up working well with Larry from the building department to make some changes on uh, some uh, non-code compliant fire escapes and stuff. And, and then from there, we just started to go on with the different building projects that we had. Uh, starting off with the septic systems and then getting into the seawall modifications. Um, I have a little presentation here. Uh, there's some redundancy here, but what I'm trying to do is just paint a better picture of what's going on out on the island. And uh, so if anybody has any questions uh, as far as the aesthetics or, or whatever, so uh, we can proceed with that. Okay, uh, basically we went over all this stuff between uh, Julie and uh, 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 Matt here. <clears throat> and this goes to show Angel Hall again in the maintenance building. I have some pictures here. Uh, you can see Angel Hall from Mason's Island Yacht Club. Uh, with Angel Hall out of the way, you're gonna have a nice view out to the chapel. So you'll be looking at a stone chapel instead of what used to be a, a sheep barn uh, on the farm. Uh, so that's going to improve the view, again, from that southerly direction. And then uh, when we look at the maintenance building, uh, the maintenance building will, uh, from Nyog Road, the maintenance building will be out of the way and the new building will be uh, in that location there. So uh, the views from Mason's Island will, uh, will improve. <clears throat> Here's the two buildings here. You see Angel Hall and you see the maintenance building and those are going to be demolished. So right now, the, uh, we have nine guys that live in this building here. This is the building that the recovery people live in presently. And you could see that, you know, it, that building there was also a building that was original to the farm. Uh, it's cold in the winter, it's hot in the summer, it's uh, inadequately sized, the bedrooms are really small, there's no support rooms in there whatsoever. And the other thing is, is that as you come into the island over to Causeway, you're approaching this building as one of the first buildings that, you, that you're able to see. Uh, so our intentions of moving the residence building back further on the island is to give them a little privacy as well as the meeting place for the uh, uh, AA to 12-step programs that we have so that they have a little more confidentiality when they're attending their meetings. So uh, uh, the new residence building will be incorporating that meeting room and the uh, and the residences, and there's the building there. Again, you know, what we're serving is people that are uh, struggling with addiction. Uh, we want to improve the way that, they, that they're living, uh, give them nicer rooms, a, a, a workout room for them to, to work out, uh, uh, their library so they, they can study, because a lot of them are taking online schooling and stuff, so they really need some uh, nice private space to work in. So <clears throat> what our plans are is to go with the ICF construction. And here's a, here's a picture right here. It shows a uh, ICF uh, built house that's in a uh, hurricane zone, and it's the only house left standing. So uh, one of the things that we want to do on the island is that we want to uh, also, you know, look at it from an environmental standpoint. You know, we want to have geothermal heating and cooling. We want to do a uh, rainwater capture system. 
and, and, uh, and we're going to also have some solar roof tiles. And so that basically, this is what, you know, uh, some of the stuff that we're going to do so that we have long-term uh, reduced uh, utility costs and able to supply a com uh, comfortable atmosphere for the people living there. The uh, traffic, I'll go right by that one there. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a couple studies that we dug up, uh, and I think uh, the attorney there also had some uh, stuff that she included into her uh, response to us. Uh, basically, the way that I went about it is I put it into a graph form. Uh, the numbers are, remain about the same as, as in the reports. This is a report from, uh, uh, this is three reports that we compiled here. And when you average them all together uh, over the years, you find out that we're about 23% of the traffic that goes on to the island. Here's some numbers here. Uh, over the years, you know, there was concerns about parking. I threw this in, this is, this is a little common. I was reading your letter there. I didn't, I didn't know how to understand uh, sir, if you your... Could, uh, sir, if you could uh, address the commission, please. Okay. Uh, and, and these are, you know, uh, you're showing your age. These are 50s cars, sir, not 60s cars. Sir, if you cars. could, please address the oh, commission. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. So this, this was back in the 50s. And if you look close enough, I believe this might have been even an event for Mason's Island Yacht Club because the cars go all the way over up uh, Yacht Club Road there. So it's hard to tell whether it was a Ender's Island event or whatever. But uh, when we tried to define parking, you know, we dug up all these aerial photos and, and the photos are hard to go by. Uh, back then, they used to just park in the grass. If they wanted to go to the chapel, they would park in what we call our great lawn right now. Uh, the parking lot over the year has changed. Um, one of the things that caused the changes was is that we were accepting uh, construction material from uh, actually from houses being built on Basin's Island. When they blasted the rock out, they were bringing the rock over uh, and we were creating berms with it. And so in 2024, that's, a, I mean, 2004 is before we had any rock uh, delivered to the island. In 2023, that picture shows our parking lot actually got smaller. Um, so the parking lot hasn't increased in size. It's actually been uh, hindered in size by the boulders that were placed over on the, uh, the right-hand side of that parking area, as you see it. And that's it. Um, I know that there were some questions uh, also on the construction phasing. Uh, basically, uh, the seawall is in construction right now. We're going to probably have that. The bulk of the work will be done by November or December. And then as we go into the first part of the year, we'll be doing some final grading and stuff on the uh, seawall. And as far as uh, Kenyon Cottage goes, we still have a lot of work with materials, uh, contractors, quotes, and whatever. So Kenyon Cottage, even uh, when we get permitted for Kenyon Cottage, it's going to be well after uh, uh, the seawall is, is actually just about finished before we even start on Kenyon Cottage. So uh, we saved a lot of truck traffic on Basin's Island by uh, crushing up all the boulders. All the crushing is done right now. Uh, we, I had not received any complaints at all from anybody on Mason's Island as far as the noise went from the crushing and the uh, uh, breaking of the rocks and so uh, you know we're looking forward to you know placing some concrete now and uh, we'll be starting on the footing soon uh, the first septic system is just about done and then after that we'll be getting into the other two systems and so that's where we that's where we stand right now okay thank you any questions from the commission no? okay thank you very much sir That's it for now. Uh, we'll hold back and, uh, and give any responses uh, to the comments. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, we just received all this material this evening. I know it was presented to the staff, I think, Thursday, but by then the staff report had gone out. So bear with us. Hopefully you'll understand. This is the first time we've seen any yeah. of this. 
uh, from last meeting? Quite, quite understood. Okay. Um, just we realized that it, it took us some time to, to put everything together. Well, I just want to make it clear that for the record that this is the first yeah. time we've seen all this. Right. Since. Thank and you. It's a lot of information, but thank you for putting it together. Okay. Um, Go ahead and get the list. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so I will try to <laughs> pronounce everybody's names correctly. I'll probably not. Um, so the first uh, to speak uh, against is Amy Sochner, attorney from Milford, Connecticut. Amy. Uh, good evening, Commission members. Uh, Amy Suchin is here representing a number of property owners on Mason's Island. Uh, what I just handed out is our letter. We also started looking at everything on Thursday, so there are a couple of things that um, I'll address that came up in the presentation. And let's start with what I think is the most important one, which is there is the applicant has admitted to you there is a zoning violation on the property. You cannot approve an application with a pending with a zoning violation. It's a fundamental premise of zoning that any kind of zoning violation would need to be reconciled and corrected before you could uh, have a site plan or frankly any other application um, approved. I think the other important point in the discussion about the FAR that was made to you is the word legal was omitted from all of the description about what happened and the nonconformity. There is a Variance, 0 0.083, as indicated. Clearly at the time, that was the understanding. It's what the applicant admitted to you. They thought that that's what they needed. The issue is, is they ultimately, as they stand here today, have a variance that's insufficient and has been insufficient for the floor area ratio on the island for the last 23 years. So um, as Commissioner uh, Conway noted, the solution is to go get a variance. They're not going to get it because it'd be a self-created hardship. It was their own error, and they've admitted that on the record. The other important point is that as a zoning violation, it's not a non-conformity. It's a zoning violation. You get the protection of a non-conforming use, non-conforming structure, non-conforming floor area, if it was legal in the first place. There was never a variance or any other approval that authorized the floor area of 0 0.095 or whatever uh, the actual existing calculation is at this point. So the protection of the nonconformity and the argument that this application presents the reduction of a nonconformity is frankly a red herring because that analysis only applies if the nonconformity was legal. Their premise would have you believe that if there was, if you committed a zoning violation, built a building in violation of the zoning regulations and left it there long enough, and the regulations arguably changed, and I don't think they have here, given that this is 2001, that somehow that violation would be protected as a nonconformity. It's not the law. And I think from there, when you look at the issues, rather than proposing to eliminate the violation, reduce the floor area down to what's allowed by the variance, they're telling you, no, actually what we would like you to do in this site plan is allow us to maintain the zoning violation and somehow bless it in the context of a site plan application. That you can't do. I think when you look at the um, more fundamental nature of what they're doing, the use, as a reminder, is also a non-conforming use in the, R, uh, in the 120 zone. What they're proposing, in addition to the floor area ratio, is the physical expansion of a non-conforming use. They are getting rid of one building that they admit is out of date, no longer serves the purpose for which it was constructed, and replacing it with a new one. That idea and that very principle undermines the comments and principles of nonconformities, which is to have them eliminated as quickly as possible and 
they're pr certainly protected to continue, but the idea that you're going to replace a building that is now outdated, that houses a non-conforming use, with a new building to allow that non-conforming use to continue is frankly inconsistent with the very notions of zoning. I think when you go back to uh, Jason Vincent's report, um, he recognizes some of the constraints that were uh, present in 2018. I'd like to point out that uh, particularly with the floor, floor area ratio uh, on page um, 11, footnote four that he notes, and footnote one, excuse me, page 12 and page 13, both of those notes indicate that he was not doing a full analysis of the floor area because there was no construction proposed. Um, foot, the note four actually says um, that this would need to be assessed if any new gross floor area is proposed. So I think the idea that, um, again, you should be relying on the Vincent report for any sort of analysis um, is undermined by the report itself. Turning to my letter, um, I just want to highlight a few things. The first, um, and I recognize you haven't had a chance to read it, um, the first part was about the floor area ratio, which I think we've addressed at length. Certainly, we have, um, you know, I recognize as Attorney Avina noted, your jurisdiction over the traffic issues are somewhat limited in this context, but um, the presentation that you were given really doesn't have any basis for where those traffic numbers came from. Um, they're a summary, but we don't know what, they're, what the source of the data was, so we did provide some of the information that um, my clients had available. Um, and I think with respect to um, the traffic issue, it overlaps with the parking. There was the, the slide you just saw about um, what has changed from 2004 to 2023. I think I direct you back to uh, Exhibit D of my prior letter, which is the aerial view of the parking lot from 2000. Um, that's even smaller. So again, we think that there have been uh, certainly some ongoing issues with respect to how the area is being used for parking. Uh, given the, uh, the fact that this parking lot has changed, there is a pending ZBA action about that determination, um, but also with respect to this argument about the nonconformity, uh, the nonconforming uses, the uses that are taking place, certainly we disagree that these are all, um, have been in place, that's my last issue. Um, we would respectfully request that pursuant to section 13.2.7 of your regulations, uh, a parking assessment be conducted. You see the photos. There has long been a parking shortfall on this property. It leads to, obviously, there's traffic concerns, but there's also an issue with insufficient parking and whether or not that is able to be um, addressed. And so we think that the uh, provision for the parking assessment would allow you to look at those um, items. And then just to conclude, the question about the um, uses and activities that are frankly proposed and back to the, the scope of the nonconformity, um, we have both the nonconforming use and the nonconforming floor area. So with respect to the nonconforming use, uh, you know, what you saw in the presentation was that um, this recovery residence uh, program has been in place for the last 58 years is what the presentation said. Um, we've provided in Exhibit D to my letter uh, copies of the brochures um, from St. Edmunds in 2018 and 2019 indicating that the program began in 2006. So once again, we think that there is um, uh, certainly a question about whether or not this is truly a non-conforming use uh, as allowed under the zoning regulations. And I think that's important for your consideration because what you have in the application, um, as I noted at the beginning, is a ex physical expansion to accommodate the non-conforming use. And that is not allowed under zoning. Uh, in Connecticut, you cannot expand a non-conforming use. As I said, the goal is to uh, conclude and bring that non-conformity to an end as soon as possible under the regulations. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Um, but I do think that there are some obvious uh, significant shortcomings that remain with the application. Um, I understand your staff has not had the opportunity to look at all the issues that we've um, 
that have been contained in the application uh, materials that were just submitted. So uh, we do think that this probably needs additional time to allow for um, you know, feedback and a better understanding of, frankly, what you would, what, what you're being asked to do um, in the context of this application. Thank you, Attorney Sessions. Next person to speak uh, against, <coughs> pardon me, against is Patty Ludwig, uh, 3 Yacht Club Road in Mystic. Ms. Ludwig. Hi. Uh, I had to choose for or against. I just happened to choose against, but I meant for, for now. I am a new resident as of three years ago on Mason's Island and was not aware that there were several lawsuits. I, I had heard of one. Um, but I had never heard that there was a lawsuit brought by some of the residents as to whether or not a group home is actually allowed by the town of Stonington anywhere, never mind on Mason's Island or Ender's Island. So my question really is to you, if this goes forward and then the, law, uh, the um, lawsuit actually wins, what happens to the building that you've just built? Does the law say that if you are doing, if the lawsuit says you can't have a group home, and this obviously is a group home, that they're pro pro saying they would like to build and asking your permission for, and you allow it, and then the lawsuit says, no, a group home's not allowed, what do you do in zoning and what do you do? I have no idea. What do you do? I will say it's a good question. I don't have a, an easy answer for you at this point. I'm not sure. Well, I know that in um, one instance, when we lived in New Jersey, somebody tried to sell their home after they built the basement. But planning and zoning said, well, you didn't have it checked for electrical or plumbing. So you have two options. Don't sell the house or rip it out. And that's what they had to do. So would you know if the building would have to come down or that they just couldn't use it as a group home if the other lawsuit wins? I, I'm, I'm stuck as to what, what would happen. Some of my other questions were, were answered um, by the last lawyer. So I'd be concerned with that. Last Thank time you. I was here, I was concerned with the amount of traffic getting worse as they build a bigger, better building, because uh, I have my grandchildren during the summer, and um, they're learning to ride bikes and skateboards and scooters. And I was concerned because I live so close to the island, and everybody going to Ender's Island comes right by my home. Now I understand my daughter's going to be living with me while she builds a house in Stonington, so the kids will be here for the school year. And I just found out because of the laws of Stonington and because we're private roads, they have to be brought to the front of the development of, near the guard shack to catch the bus. So I'm concerned now we have no sidewalks, we have no place to jump off except people's lawns, which the kids are taught don't step on that. That's not your yard. Will this make the, the traffic bad or could we perhaps say let's change some of the times for people going to church so that we make sure it's after the kids go to the school bus or can we have something done that says you know for for the time when the buses are coming back home and the kids are walking or biking which is what i see now can we eliminate people coming on the island that that aren't doing 20 miles an hour, which is quite a few of the people on the island. I happen to use my, my um, I, I put my car on 20 miles an hour and I can't maintain it. I put it on 21 and I can maintain the, the amount of 21 miles per hour based on my car setting this, the uh, speed control, cruise control, excuse me. And I find that when I'm doing 21 miles an hour, which is over the limit, I admit it, but at least I'm a steady 21, everybody's going faster than me. I don't know whether they belong on the island or just are visiting the island, 
but I can say the majority of the cars are not doing 20 miles an hour. So I would like planning and zoning to look at that when you're saying, oh yes, we're gonna allow you to increase the number of beds, which increases the number of people because I'm concerned about the kids on the, on the, on the whole island, but specifically on Chippechog and Yacht Club because those are, that's how most people get to Enders and those people don't live there. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. All right, next person uh, to speak is Dexter Murphy, Chen Chippechog Trail Mystic uh, in favor. Hi, good evening. Evening. My name is Dexter Murphy and I reside at 10 Chippechog Trail, Mystic, the main road with a 20 mile per hour speed limit. The traffic travels to and from Enders Island. The recovery program at Enders rehabilitates young men that have an addiction issue that they want to correct to improve both their lives and indirectly the lives of their friends and relatives. I would like to voice a hypothetical. That is a person with an addiction problem has three choices. He can attempt to improve his lot in life. He can remain the same or he can get worse. The hypothetical is a future addicted person untreated and not in a rehabilitation program has a potential of causing an accident that hurts himself, others, and a great sadness to himself, others, his family, and others' family. A tragic situation. The newspaper uh, obviously reports drug driving accidents. Although it's impossible to equate, it is my belief that the recovery program at Enders does, does lead to a potential reduction in addiction-related accidents in the future. I do want to point out that I can't predict their future. Only God can do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This letter to whoever. Thank you. Next person is Kathleen Kennedy, One Yacht Club Road, uh, in favor. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name's Kathleen Kennedy. I live at One Yacht Club Road. I'm part of this whole neighborhood here. And it's very painful to have to stand up here in front of my neighbors and my friends, some of whom think one way and some think another. And I have to tell you what I think. I'm at One Yacht Club Road. I'm at the little corner. When you turn the corner to come down to uh, the Yacht Club and then on to Enders Island, you go by my house. There's a speed bump in front of my house and a stop sign. The house was built in 46 and since then has been turned, down, turned uh, forward played forward to my aunt, to my parents, and now to me. I remember being a little girl there and playing on the rocks. My grandchildren have been there. I've seen a lot of changes, a lot of changes with traffic on the whole island. The Yacht Club is so much bigger than it was. Um, parties there will rival any party that's over on Enders Island trying to fundraise money. But I accept it. It's part of my community. And there hasn't been one day that's gone by that I haven't felt grateful to be where I am because it's a wonderful place. Imagine being able to walk down the street to a yacht club. Walk. I walk down the street and you can see I don't walk very well, but I'm comfortable walking down the street. I ride a tricycle down the street. My grandchildren, my children, the only problem that ever happens is when a car speeds by. Does it come from Enders? Well, I don't think so, not all the time. 
pretty good chance it comes from that yacht club where there's a cocktail party pretty often going on. But again, it's my community. It's, it's life here. And in closing, I just want to say, I've also had a really strong connection to Ender's Island. Between my aunt and I, we worked there 30 years. I was very lucky at the end of my work life to be employed there, to get to know the recovery program. By the way, I went to AA there 35 years ago. I was able to raise my children and educate them and to move forward in this community and to build my life because I learned about AA on Ender's Island. The young men that are there are wonderful. The parents that bring their children there are from, some of them are from our own community. They're wonderful people. And my, my sadness comes from the fact that the people who in the past have become very antagonistic towards Enders don't know it. I stop and I talk to everyone that walks by my house. And I haven't met one person coming and going from Enders or the Yacht Club that I haven't thought how lucky I am. So as you consider making this wonderful improvement to this island, this precious, beautiful piece of Connecticut, I want you to think of that and the wonderful life it has given all of us, and it has enhanced our life. And someday, when things need to be fixed on Mason's Island, when the sea starts to encroach on the Mason's Island Yacht Club, I hope you'll help us then. Because we're going to need some help, because the water's going to come, and the Yacht Club's going to have no place to go, no place to park the cars, and we have to be open-minded and let the future come, but embrace everything that this beautiful community has. So thank you, I hope I haven't been too emotional, but I hope you also understand this has torn our community apart. And it's a wonderful community. And it's a new community of neighbors. And some of those most important neighbors are sitting right here. Father Tom, the people that work there, the people that visit there, they're our neighbors, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last person signed up to speak is Barry Saluk. I hope I pronounced that correctly. 17 Skiff Lane in Mystic in favor. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in favor of the application. Uh, just uh, by way of introduction, um, my wife, Mari, and I bought a house at 17 Skiff Lane on Mason's Island in, uh, 30 years ago, in April of 94, and made it our home, raised our children here, and they all went to Stonington schools, and um, um, also, by way of full disclosure, I'm also the, the chair of the board of trustees of Enders Island, and also in the past have... Uh, been the commodore of the Yacht Club, spent you know, eight years volunteering there and helping to run the Yacht Club. So I can kind of speak from both property owners a little bit, but uh, I wanted to just, to sit, you know, just to speak tonight in favor of the application as a resident and, and what I've seen uh, over the past 30 years. Um, yes, traffic has increased, no question about that. But, but we've seen through the three studies that were conducted by others, by, by, by the opposition uh, to Enders Island, uh, that the percentage of cars going out to Enders has not in increased. When we first moved here, we had two cars, and it was my wife and I, we each had our own car, but now if our three children come home with their significant others, there's eight cars in our driveway. You know, so when we first moved here, there were we would say probably 20% of the houses were all year round. Now I would say 80% of the houses are all year round. What Kathleen was saying it, it is correct. It is a wonderful community. There's somewhere around 220 households on, on Mason's Island. And there is a group that doesn't like uh, 
Anders Island that live on Mason's Island too, and they deserve to be heard, uh, but they're a small group. And people ask me when I see them at the grocery store or whatever, they'll say, what's going on? You know, uh, my wife was the president of the fire district and we're both involved in the community. And, you know, my observation has been, um, it falls into three categories. There are people, it's NIMBY, not in my backyard, even though it's kind of like buying a house next to the railroad tracks and saying, geez, I don't know the train is gonna be going by. I should have looked first before I, we, we signed the uh, sales agreement. NIMBY, not in my backyard. Second category, I would say, is um, just kind of fear, you know, fear of maybe unknown, people that don't know Enders Island, don't know the good work that's gone on, that goes on there. And the third, and I've experienced all three of these, you know, I'm speaking firsthand, is good old-fashioned anti-Catholicism, which, which exists, and I experience it uh, all the time. Uh, and it, it, it is a thing, and, you know, but it, it is true. And, um, Going, going, going forward, um, I think what needs to be looked at here is what is Enders Island? It is really a, a treasure. It is really a gem of the Stonington community. When we first moved here, and then our neighbor told us, you know, you can go over there. And we went over there, and then we saw there was a chapel, and we said, wow, we can go to Mass here. And we, our, our kids um, all went to Mass there. What a gem. But then watching the, the, uh, the young men and learning more about the recovery program and the AA meetings for men and women and seeing the lives that have been saved and changed. And it's not just that one person, it's exponential throughout that family and their friends. And I think that it be, it's a very small number of families today that don't somehow experience the horror of addiction in their own families or their extended families, and I've done that. I recently lost, lost a niece very close to me uh, from addiction, and I wish I could have helped her more. But um, I think you, we, you know, we can nitpick and say, well, it was this, that, and the other thing, but you have to look at what is the good for the community that's going on out there. And I think that's really the important thing. And um, yes, the Yacht Club um, does have big parties, and as Commodore, you know, we, we, were, you know we, were, we were always hurting for revenue, so we uh, significantly increased the amount of availability for weddings so that we could have even more big parties and rent the, rent the grounds out with tents and everything else. And it was always a nightmare of mine when I would see hundreds of people there and a lot of drinking going on and worry about the liability of all those, you know, not just the residents walking around, but the people going home. So... Um, it's not, I'm not here to point fingers, but I'm just hoping that uh, this, this uh, zoning commission can see the good that is going on out there and what is the next right step forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes the list and the folks who signed up to speak for or against or in general comments. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to Speak either way. Sure. First. I'm going to try to be brief, and I just want to. Uh, come back to reality here a little bit. Uh, talk sir, about if I may it. ask if you could uh, identify yourself, please. Yes, uh, Ethan you. Tower, Two Yacht Club Road. Thank you. Um, I like to talk about what is it, what some of the things that actually are happening down there that you should be aware of. Uh, the photo that you see there is what happens because of the lack of parking at Ender's Island. Okay, you can see cars parking on the Yacht Club side of the causeway. People walking across the causeway to access Ender's Island. The problem is, and I brought this up at the last meeting, there's insufficient parking at Enders Island, okay? And it's a problem that needs to get solved. Their usages have changed over the years. They added the Art Institute. They've got the recovery program going. They're encouraging public recreation. But the reality is there's not enough parking there. The second sheet in that packet um, I went to try to find usage information. And actually, you asked for usage information at the last meeting and say, can we get some tables 
showing what the usages are by the various buildings. Unfortunately, what's been submitted so far with this site plan is very sketchy. I did go looking around and I found the usage information that was submitted by SER in conjunction with our septic systems, which is very useful and much more detailed. Unfortunately, <coughs> it's very hard to read. So on the third page, I made a table. I extracted the relevant information so you can see what kind of usage is going on out there. In Colby Cottage, they're planning on having 12 employees. Uh, in the old chapel, uh, the Art Institute, they're planning on supporting 25 people. St. Michael's Hall, 27 bedrooms. Kenyon Cottage, uh, 14 residents, although I think it's down to 12 now, plus one studio apartment. The chapel, 120 seats. Ender's house, 10 bedrooms, four employees, two laundry machines, 85 seats in the restaurant. I went to the tables that are supposed to tell you how much parking you're supposed to have for all those usages. Unfortunately, they don't align quite right, so I had to do some interpretation. But a lot of it, like the you know, St. Michael's Hall, it's essentially a hotel. You need one parking space per room. When you look at the restaurant, you're supposed to have one space for every four seats. The chapel, similarly, one space for every four seats. When I ran the math on that, <laughs> I came up with 145 parking spaces that are needed out there to support their uses. And these are the uses that they put in their septic system applications. Okay? So they need 145 spaces, but that doesn't include volunteers, meetings, conferences, the people who come down there for public recreation. They need some place to park too. And unfortunately, <clears throat> in the report from BSC, they say that they, can, that they have three accessible parking spaces that can support 72 vehicles on the campus. But they believe that the 72 exceeds the actual campus capacity. The reality is they need 145 or more parking spaces to support the uses, but they have less than 72. And the consequence is, consequence is the picture I showed you very first, that the traffic overflows <coughs> back onto Mason's Island. People park there, they have to walk across the causeway. And as I requested before at the last meeting, we really like to have something done about that. I think Amy mentioned, Attorney Suchins mentioned having a parking assessment done. I think it would be very useful to do that and to make sure that on the site plans they show sufficient parking for what their usages actually are. Does that make sense? It does, doesn't it? That they should have adequate parking for all these uses. I mean, before they do any more building, any more expansion, let's make sure that they <coughs> can support what they're doing there. Thank you. Thank you. Father? Uh, Father Tom Horth, uh, One Enders Island, uh, Mystic, Connecticut. Um, just a couple of clarifications. We don't have a restaurant. We don't have a hotel. Uh, we have a dining room for the people who live there and uh, participate in our programs. Um, there seems to be a little bit of uh, in, ingenuous uh, things put forward. You know, we're constantly uh, hearing from the, the uh, town planning uh, uh, zoning office that there's another um, zoning complaint. And actually, Father, if I can hold uh, just for a second here, I just want to, um, Attorney, is this constituting part of your rebuttal to the public comments, or is this? Okay. okay, all right, thank you. I just wanted to get that clear. Sorry, yeah. Father. Right. Recently, there was a complaint by someone um, on Mason's Island that we had an outdoor oil tank, and it wasn't in compliance. We didn't have it in a well. Um, 600, 800 gallon tank, um, a well's required for an uh, outdoor tank of 3,500 gallons. But it's another uh, time and effort that we have to uh, address. Um, 
I'm, I'm saddened by uh, all of this, and I've been dealing with it on and off for 31 years. Um, one time I was excoriated because our light pollution was uh, preventing nesting turtles uh, from uh, uh, the coast of uh, Stonington. From what I understand, there are no nesting turtles in um, the Stonington waters. I was uh, excoriated at one meeting because um, a, um, a street light at the end of our causeway on the, uh, on the um, telephone pole was shining in someone's window and they couldn't sleep at night. I had done my research and I asked the person, uh, when did they move to the island, when did they move to that uh, house, and they moved there in the mid-80s. That light uh, was there since 1968. So it, it's a constant um, um, kind of battle. Um, and I understand we live in a, in a society and if, uh, uh, we're, if you stand up for certain values, you're often um, uh, shouted down. And we see that in social media all the time. As a, as a Catholic community, we seek uh, to improve the lives of other people. We, um, we seek to bring healing and hope to people who, are, who have lived in despair, despondency, and hopelessness for years. The, um, you know, yes, the uh, recovery, collegiate recovery residence, we, we say, started in 2006. But we've had uh, people in early recovery living on the island since the 60s. When I was a, a student there in 1971, we had two or three um, young men living um, uh, in early recovery, living on the island because we had a, a vibrant um, AA uh, program. Uh, the, the lives that have been changed, um, the lives that, that have been healed, the lives that have been uh, given hope is what motivates me. I get, I get the legalese, I get the, the uh, 0.083, the 0.091, the, the, the size of the island, you know, grew when we had this latest uh, uh, A21 survey done. I get it, I get it. But I'm hoping that you'll look beyond some of that um, uh, stuff and see that this is an asset for the Stonington community. Um, people come um, and they cross our causeway and you never know why they're crossing it. Sometimes they come because uh, they're just overwhelmed by uh, the vagaries of life. They come because their mother just died. They come because they don't know where else to go. They come uh, because they want to sit in the, in the beauty of Enders Island. Our gardens, I don't know if you've ever been there, but in the summer our gardens are spectacular. Um, and we um, uh, allow people to come, to sit at the gar in the gardens, to walk our grounds, pray in our chapel, join us at table. Um, and we don't exclude anyone. If somebody wants to participate in one of our programs and they can't afford it, they come anyways. You know, um, it costs us about $10,000 a month for, uh, uh, for a young man uh, to be in our recovery program for therapy, food, clothes, uh, housing, uh, oftentimes medical, dental, uh, education. Uh, most of them can't afford it. Their families can't afford it. That's why we have an event like Holy Smoke June, uh, June 15th, if you want to come. It starts at 6. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, but we have two big events a year to raise money. You know, we have offered the use of our, uh, our, uh, island, our island, our parking lot, to the Mason's Island folks, especially the Yacht Club. And the, uh, the pictures that uh, Ethan showed, I'm not sure exactly when they were, but we've hosted um, uh, memorial services for people on Mason's Island and they have had to walk across the causeway because the reception is at the uh, Yacht Club. You know, you can pick and um, parse all of this stuff. Are we trying to increase the traffic? No. 
is trafficked increased, it has across the island. We worked with Rufus in 2004. He did all the measurements. And in 2018, 2019, we didn't do the traffic studies. The folks on Mason's Island did the traffic studies and gave us the numbers. And then we're told we don't know where the numbers came from. Hmm? Um, and so you have to you wonder. You know, there's snickering when, when uh, Barry Selleck says there's anti-Catholic uh, sentiment. There is. It's in our society. Look what's happened to this young um, football player who spoke at a, a Catholic man, speaking at a Catholic college to Catholic Father, if I, if I may, can we make, yeah. bring it back to yeah. the specifics so of the, the application, so please? So I'm hoping that you'll look at the, uh, the benefit that this brings to the Stonington community. And you know, put some of the, the nitpicking aside and see the benefit that this brings. We're not increasing the number of beds. We're not increasing, uh, with this site plan, we're not increasing the number of um, uh, cars on the island because of it, because most of the guys in the recovery community don't have cars. They're not allowed. So I hope that you can look beyond and do what's right not necessarily what is exact. Thank you, Father. Thank you. <laughs> An attorney, just a moment. Just, uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak for or against or just general comments before we go into a more formal rebuttal portion from the attorney? Sir, you can state your name, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Frank Marco. I live on Skiff Lane, a neighbor of Barry's. Um, I'm very disturbed by the arguments that are being made by some of my neighbors and some of the other people who have spoken. I mean, what they're essentially telling you to do is ignore the law, ignore the zoning. I thought we, I'm, I'm, I was a lawyer for 40 years. I thought we lived in a country of laws where everybody has to follow the law, even if you think you have a higher cause or maybe God is asking you to do something. I'm a Catholic. When we first moved to Mason's Island, I made a substantial contribution to the building of the chapel. To hear people, in the innuendo or even express statements about anti-Catholicism is total garbage. I've been involved with this since 2011 when we first learned about all the activities going on on, on on Enders Island and became very upset when a car was stolen and, you know, long story. And this has evolved. And we've been stonewalled by them when we've tried to reach some sort of reconciliation. Instead is, is let us wrap ourselves in the flag of God and do what we want to do. So I ask you to follow the zoning, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else would like to speak for, against, or general comments? Okay, uh, attorney. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a long uh, two hearings and we appreciate uh, hearing us out, uh, hearing the application. I'm just gonna take a minute here uh, to say what we're not doing. We're not expanding a thing. That's not the purpose. We're not expanding a use and we're not expanding a structure. We are painfully taking away structures from the island in order to put a different structure on that's much more efficient, that staff has carefully reviewed and has much less nonconformities, much better building code improvements than what's there now. So that's what we are doing. The nonconforming uses, as they say in the statute, and we say follow the law from a 40-year lawyer uh, practicing, statute 8-2 says that no local zoning regulations, they shall not prohibit the continuation of any nonconforming use, building, or structure existing at the time of the adoption of the regulations. This island was not created under a Bob Birmingham R120. That zone was in place put over the top of Enders Island. That's where the issue started. 
The island wasn't the issue. The uses that were happening out there weren't the issue. Jason Vincent did an incredible job, which is in your record, so please read it. It's the best analysis that this 45-year practicing planning and zoning lawyer has ever seen about a single piece of property, and I've been practicing in Stonington since 1996. It's an excellent review of the fact that non-conforming uses are protected under state law. That's the whole point. And when they are protected, they are distinct and different from your zoning. We all know that there's no way an FAR on the island is 0.04. That never happened. That was imposed on top of the island. We've now determined that the FAR was much larger than the 0.04 when it was in place. It was very high. It was up in the 0.089 or something in that range prior to the chapel. But unlike my fellow consul's uh, argument, law, the law was we needed a variance to put another structure on the island. So what did we do? We went and got a variance. And we added to the FAR of the island. End story. That's what happened. And the chapel got built. And here we are. We've now determined that with the chapel, we have an existing FAR that's incredibly close to what Jason Vincent wrote up in his report of 2018. That's the law. The law can't be changed. The staff knows that. You don't go back 25 years now and say, well, we don't like the fact that the variance was recorded and the building was built. Well, it got built, and it's still there. What we're suggesting in this application is very narrow. We're not adding a building to therefore increase the nonconformity. I agree with Consul. You can increase nonconformities, but you can live with them. The statute protects them. So the nonconformity here is of, of the nature of the FAR. It's already where it is, and we'll stay under it. So we are lessening that nonconformity, which every case everybody reads from here to Milford is what the court wants us to do. They want you to diminish nonconformities, and that's exactly what we're doing here. There will be no additional parking. We make that presentation. We've been talking about it for two meetings now. The parking lot is another red herring. She gets to go argue that to a different board, and your zoning officer has already opined that there's nothing wrong with our parking lot. Uh, it has been pre-existing, I think, much like the Mason Island Yacht Club parking lot. So we are entitled to that nonconforming parking. So that's not an issue for, before you tonight. And we're not even suggesting that we would add cars by putting uh, uh, the new structure uh, with the beds in it. So an effort that we've been trying to make is, is to stay within the law. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I'm a planning and zoning lawyer. I wouldn't do it any other way. You have two briefs in front of you now. I, I, I know that they just came in today. Um, you have all the evidence that we've produced regarding the FAR analysis. Uh, certainly, you have the town attorney if you need them. We understand it, you know, it may be a legal issue, and we appreciate your time to look at that and realize what our effort is here. It's to, it's to be below what's now on the island, and I think that's what's legal, and I believe it's defensible, uh, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Clifton. Uh, I would ask for the staff report, but I realize, or input, we've gotten so much new information that that kind of is not logical at this point, I don't think. That's correct. Um, just between what I've received in the uh, application set that was delivered on the 14th, or delivered on the 15th, uh, dated the 14th, um, I, we have distributed that through the routing sheet to all the relevant agencies, town staff members to provide additional comment. Obviously could not receive that within a one day turnaround time. So between that, myself and my department being unable to review the new application set, the um, immediate recommendation was to not have the commission make a decision on this application tonight. Um, bringing in the comments from, or the exhibits from both councils, um, both the applicant and the council for the uh, Mason's Island group. Uh, again, I think my staff and myself need additional time to review uh, those agree. documents, um, provide a thorough analysis to the commission before any decision is made. Um, the only other thing that I would mention as part of my report is 
um, over the past five, six days, uh, my office has received significant amounts of public comment regarding this application. Um, I'll say the vast majority of it, with, although I don't have a total number, is in a, against the application. Um, I have that here provided. I'd recommend that the commission take time to come review that public comment at their convenience, um, just making that part of, part of the record instead of distributing the you know, hundreds of letters I've received. So. Okay, thank you, Clifton. So if I understand it correctly, um, but we, we're kind of at a bit of a crossroads here. And so I think the first option, and I want to run it by you, Clifton, is we need more time to review this information. There was a lot submitted in a short period of time. As I understand it, if there's not an extension requested by the applicant, then we would have to close the public hearing tonight. Not necessarily vote, but close the public hearing. Is that a correct understanding? That'd be correct. Okay. So I would ask the applicant, and you've heard and seen from both sides and everything that's been submitted here, that's a lot of information, and frankly, I haven't had time to review it, neither as staff, probably no one on the commission. So would you be willing to request an extension, and you can determine the time, I think you have up until 237 days, is that correct from what I see here, Clifton? An extension of up to 37, you don't have to obviously extend to 37, but. Attorney Rob Avina again, um, what we would suggest is to close the public hearing tonight. I think you do have a lot that's come in both last hearing and this hearing. Uh, we applied for a site plan, which does not necessitate by this commission a public hearing. If it was a special permit, then it's required under statutes. If it's a site plan, you may do one, but it's not required. So we appreciate all the time you put in, and we think there is a pretty extensive record, and we certainly appreciate you're going to review it over the next 10 or 20 days, and we can give you time to do that. Uh, we would not expect any response or vote from the commission until, uh, you know, sometime in your June, mid-June meeting or so. Uh, but we do think that we've now probably covered the ground that we possibly can as far as the public hearing and, and comments. Okay. So you... You would not be requesting any kind of extension, just to make that clear. Uh, an extension if you needed to deliberate, but not to continue another public hearing. Okay, so you're not requesting that. All right. So, with that said, then, Clifton, what other options do we have? I know we could close the public hearing this evening, and that would stop any further submissions of any other materials, correct, as I understand it? Anything that would be considered new material, material that's on a able to be commented on by the public, yes. Okay. So, uh, I, I have a question. I, I think there's, this is complicated from a legal perspective. I think that the commission should get some advice from the town lawyer uh, for some of these questions that have surfaced um, having to do with conformity, FAR, m perhaps errors perhaps made in the past, a lawsuit that's pending, what happens, so that we have a clear understanding of, of everything before we make a decision or have any further discussion. So my question is, if you close the public hearing, and we get that that the town lawyers uh, opinion. advice and opinion uh, you can you clarify how that's going to work for everyone please since that would be considered part of the staff review process it wouldn't be considered ex parte communication so we could do that um, that would be the only thing that's going to get in the way is if the comments from staff review or you know, the multiple staff agencies that we've sent out request updates to the documents provided by the applicant. Um, that would not be permissible in terms of them providing updated information because the public hearing would be closed. So what we would do instead would just be stipulates in case of approval, just stipulate all those requirements, which we've done in the past. Um, so we could close a public hearing, send it out for attorney review. Um, I think there's a significant amount of issues and items that would need to be covered. Um, some of them, 
probably are not germane to what's being discussed with this application, mm -hmm. ongoing lawsuits and litigation that might not be particularly relevant to this. Um, but again, we can explore that with the town attorney. And to follow up to Lynn's question, so I know there was supposed to be, a, I think, a Zoning Board of Appeals hearing on one item, and that got canceled Correct. And I continued. believe, and I'm going to look at attorney solutions, that's June 11th? June 11th. June 11th, CBA. Okay. That also so that, that was rescheduled from the original April 9th, correct? All right. Okay. So that was rescheduled to June rescheduled. 11th. Okay. And that's okay. in relation to the parking that's in, included in the memo. Closing it tonight would give uh, Chuck time to review this video. True. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so then if we were to close it tonight, uh, then we would have to make, we would have to vote on this by June 27th. Is that my understanding? With, without so, extension, yes. Without extension. Okay. Let me ask a question then. Um, first, does that, does that fe seem like enough time for the staff to adequately review and also to gather the comments from the other committees or, you know, entities that were sent, <clears throat> excuse me, information. I think the only pinch point is how exhaustive will the town attorney's review need to be mm -hmm. um, in order to give the commission enough information to make a response. So I'm not going to speak on their behalf. Um, I think that's going to be the only struggle in terms right. of a timing, but we could work with the applicant if they need to ex ask for an extension to go beyond that date. Oh, so they could still technically ask for an extension? Yep, they still have that 37-day period that they can request an extension on, and that would be for even, the Even after we have closed the public hearing? Okay, well, it's good to know that. Uh, all right, so any further discussion or suggestions? Well, I'm, so, I'm confused. Clifton, I'm confused. You're saying if we close it tonight, you can't reopen it in 37 days. No, that would no. just be the extension for the deliberation. Yeah. So, so they could request an extension for deliberations, not for the extension of the public hearing. Okay, good, Correct. good clarification. <clears throat> Go ahead, Lynn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I move that we close the public hearing. Okay, I hear a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Okay. Motion second. All those in favor? Aye. Closing the public hearing? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All those abstained? Okay, motion passes. The public hearing for this application has been closed. So I think the next and only those city table. Okay. I need a motion to table table the discussion. I motion that we table the discussion until further staff review and input from town council. Thank you, Lynn. Do I hear a just, second on the motion? You just have to, you have to provide a date. Of, okay, what's the next hearing date logically? June 4th? Okay. Uh, June, 4th. June 4th. Okay, June 4th. All right. Do I hear a second for the motion? Second. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Against? All right, motion carries. All right. A motion to um, no. Hold on. close. Oh, I'm, not close. Go ahead. We, ha we have other items. Oh, on we the do? Agenda. Yeah, oh. I think there's some other items here. So. Okay. <laughs> can, uh, Mr. Chair, can we, take a, can we take a pause while other people are clearing the room? There's sure. a lot of noise feedback that we can't. Okay. Uh, we'll call the meeting back to order. Uh, well, I mean, you know, five. Okay. Uh, Clifton, you said we had some other items to work on. Correct. So, um, as requested in previous meetings, and I want to make this a trend going forward, when we have new applications um, or new submittals, I want to formally accept them. You can accept them as a group or individually. Um, this would be the time where if we have a site plan application, this would be the time where the commission would choose whether or not it needs a public hearing. Um, regarding what's been provided, the only item is of note is item D, PZ 2413, SPA and GPP. That is, that project, um, that site plan is semi in conjunction with 
um, item C that already has a public hearing scheduled, but since it's a site plan, it doesn't necessarily need one. The applicant has requested just to combine and do a uh, public hearing for both applications, and so that just needs to be formally made by the board. Uh, they're both part of the site plan for the uh, NDD? Correct. The proce procedurally, they're doing a master plan update, which needs a zone change application, and then procedurally, they want to do a site plan, which would be the first item after the zone change. So I see. they're Maybe doing two applications in one, so they're going to be formally separate, but since we're going to be discussing the same topic at the meeting, they requested both of them be public hearings. Okay. Any concern? Nope. From your, okay. All right. Just any, formality. Any, oh, understood. Any discussion on this? Or, right, do I hear a motion? So, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. Just hold on. Okay. I'm sorry. I was, I was reading the list. Um, so the first one on the list having to do, it's um, PZ241 uh, has uh, Generation 4 LLC. Yep. Uh, that doesn't have a date. Oh, I see. Yeah, June 18. June 18. Yeah. Okay. Correct. So items A, B, and C already have public hearings scheduled. Okay. Item D, staff is recommending at the request of the applicant to, to consolidate. have a public okay. hearing. Yep. And then it would be up to item E um, whether or not the commission would choose to do a public hearing, but staff's not recommending it one way or another. Um, is this for a lot of the nonconformities that they've already done? Item E, yes. E, yes. Terenzia. Correct, yes. So you don't it's, think a public It's in meeting? conjunction with uh, 2018 SUP. So you don't think a public hearing is necessary? Uh, largely, no. Um, there's, a, there's a procedural element I'm working out with the applicant on that at this time. Isn't hmm. okay. oh, sorry, excuse me. No, not worse. I'm, I, I'm reading it still. <laughs> so at least on the first one, I think two, two separately. So uh, the first thing I think we need to decide on is combining C and D. Is my understanding correct? Uh, it's or, not a combination. It's just you we're formally saying that. We are requesting a public hearing for this item. Oh, formally, okay, so it'll be tied to C. Correct. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I, I agree with that. Okay. Right. We need to make a motion and a vote on that, or can we just? Uh, yeah, just make a motion to say we're requesting a public hearing for the item D. Okay. PZ 2413. I'd like to, to raise a motion that we request a public hearing for items, uh, for item D. Thank you, Lynn. Second on the motion? Thank you. Motion's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? Abstain? Okay, motion carries. Uh, next item is item E. So, uh, again, maybe explain to me why. Is there a reason you don't think we need a public hearing? Not that I'm looking I'm not, I'm not going to normally recommend um, public hearings for site plans unless either one, um, it's been requested by the applicant, or two, in the case of you know, an application like tonight that I know there's going to be very significant mm -hmm. public comment opportunity desired. Okay. Um, and so normally, no, I'm not going to recommend public hearings for every site plan. It's just ones that either staff feels that there's going to be significant public comment on, like the one tonight, mm -hmm. um, or ones that have been requested by the applicant. Okay. Let me ask you how that works. So. Let's say there was a neighbor involved in this. I, I, I don't recall this, but let's say there was a neighbor involved with it, and we don't have a public hearing. How is that neighbor informed, or is the neighbor informed, that a site plan, plan has been um, submitted for staff review, but there'll be no public hearing, and if you want to give any comments to the staff, please Right, the email. same way we statutorily do any project that doesn't have a public hearing. So, I mean, a butter notices are filed, um, but sometimes it's up just up to the ah, neighboring party themselves. 
but that's how that's how it statutorily works in the state. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Point of order, Ben. Yeah. Um, I think this is different because I'm referring to Broadway. It was originally approved with the original application. The original application for 32 Broadway was approved with a public hearing. The original application, as as noted here, is a, was a special use permit. Right. But so this is a modification to a special use permit, really. Which, if that is in my recollection, it's not, it's that not updating the special use. It's updating site plan well, related elements. That the site plan is part of the special use permit, because a special use permit has to submit a site plan as part of its approval. Okay. This is just updating elements to that. That wouldn't trigger a special use permit being reviewed. So it doesn't necessarily need a public hearing. It's just a site plan application. Will it, will it include the um, ZBA's decision? No, and that's why I mentioned the, that's why I mentioned the um, scheduling issue related to that project, so. What's the, I missed that, what's the scheduling well, issue? Well, again, I don't, I don't want to, we're not speaking on an app, I don't want to speak on an no, application right. without yeah, the applicant understood. present, so I don't right. want to talk about that at this time. Okay. Um, it's just the recommendation for staff that this doesn't need a public hearing. It, but I, I, so this is um, 32 Broadway, is that the, um, right next to the firehouse? So I disagree, and the, and the reason I disagree is that was, um, that, that application and special use permit received a lot, I, I believe there was a lot of discussion uh, and input from neighbors on that. And the discussions were very detailed about having a green fence so high to block the, the next the building over. Except, I mean, it was very, very detailed discussion from the neighbors. So I just think that might be one <clears throat> where not not having been um, participating in it, you might not realize that that was a little con not controversial. There was a lot of discussion about it. And I'll just give the staff perspective <clears throat> of when we look at applications that come in largely unless it's updating something else like a special use permit, we're looking at the content of what's changing. And so and when I make a recommendation that this doesn't need it, a uh, public hearing, it's because the application is for the relocation of utilities, updated landscaping, and associated site improvements. So we're not talking about the structure at all. And the structure was what garnered a lot of the public comment. Some of it was landscaping, but are we going to require public hearing for landscaping? I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Hmm. And so the, I'm so just going to say, I and totally I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying in this instance, there was a lot of discussion about landscaping, a lot. Because uh, I remember it distinctly because the building is so close to the building next to it <clears throat> that, and they wanted to put some kind of a, a green fence type thing and there was a, a lot of discussion on how that would work between those two properties. And that's why I ask about the public hearing and how that, that neighbor would now find out and be able to comment. I, you know, and again, it's just because um, I remember it. <laughs> no, I, I, Lynn, I remember it too, but I also remember that you know, Things were agreed upon between both the parties and the neighbor at the time, you know, to their satisfaction. Um, and, and my, no, and if I may, and I'm concerned also maybe setting a precedent to Clifton's point now, we're going to kind of open the door, we're going to, you know, these small things yeah, and, are going to engender a public and hearing. And again, and I, again I want to caution because we're venturing on talking about applications without yeah. the applicant present. True. So although I understand the conversation and why we need to have it, um, and I apologize for opening the can of worms by making mm -hmm. us go through this process, but procedurally choosing what 
could be a public hearing versus not was a staff decision and I don't believe that it's appropriate for a staff decision or staff itself to make decisions on what should and should not be public Understood. hearings. So I wanted to formalize this process. I understand that there are going to be conversations or pitfalls associated with that. So apologies in advance. All right. So I guess then we need a, a decision um, you know, or a motion. Do we want to have a public hearing for this or do we not? So what's the commission's pleasure? If you open it and nobody comes forward and it's straightforward, then it's five minutes of our time. I just, again, I, I'm very uncomfortable when I know that the original application was very detailed and neighbors were very vocal and, and agreements were made, not knowing what, these, what this is all about, if it changes any part of that agreement, I think that's that's when you have to have a public hearing. So I don't I don't know because you can't tell us, and I totally understand that. But if it's a chance that it touches upon the the discussion and kind of the wants and and needs and bone of contention between the parties, I think you have to have a public hearing. You can't just say a staff member is going to make a decision and the other the other party doesn't even know about it okay, that's so, just my personal opinion okay so you're in favor of a public hearing yes. gary you're in favor of public hearing and just for clarity's sake are the alternates also a, allowed to weigh in on allowed to discuss but to discuss, not to vote, vote so. All right, okay yeah, we just my recommendation would be, um, you know, as Lynn said, you know, have it be available to for the public if they wanted to chat. Okay. But also with that, if it's a very specific, minute detail in that, that everything doesn't get brag, brought back up because the site plan and everything else has already been approved. So we're not, you know, the, we're talking about the changes, not. So we'd have to be very to, specific about the public what could right. be covered in the public hearing. So it, my, so and just yes, yeah. same as any other application. Yeah, and that just that. The chat and the public hearing of that doesn't go back to okay. offside of things of a building or uses or anything like that. That's not the actual change. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll state personally. I was gonna go against a public hearing. I think we've covered that ground, and I think you know I would proceed to Clifton's professional opinion. However, I understand the commission's concerns, and so I would also, having said that, say let's have a public hearing for this with a very strict stipulation or, you know, def defining what we're actually going to be allowing the public to discuss on that, if that makes sense. It would, yeah, it would be a public hearing just like any other application at that point. So but just be, specifically for this, and they couldn't the, yeah, go Which we would others. do for any other application, yes. Okay. All right. So do we have a motion then? We need a motion to uh, have I think a public Gary, hearing? I think Gary already made one. Oh, did he already? Okay, and Lynn seconded it. So, all those in favor of having this? No, oh, no, you don't want it. I, I second. <laughs> okay, you're, you're you're on it. You're on it now. All right. I'm in favor. Okay, all those in favor of uh, scheduling and having a public hearing for PZ 401 for SPAG development. Uh, say aye. 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 All against. Extensions. Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right, and do we have one final motion for this evening? Please, please, please. Come on, come on, guys. Buddy system. Mr. Chair, I make a motion to close the meeting. Yes. And uh, second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? Nobody's against. Motion carries. Thank you.